Hello everyone, I'm Laura and this is my mum Lynn. We would like to thank you for you all inviting us here to speak at the conference. It's lovely to be here. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes on the 15th of February 2010 when I was 8 years old. I have now had type 1 diabetes for half of my life. I don't remember what life was like it before I had it. I don't remember much about my diagnosis. My mum's memory is much more better than mine. Um, I took Laura to our GP as she'd been drinking lots and was very tired. It was an evening appointment at about 6.30pm. In the back of my mind, I had thought about type 1 diabetes. However, I had ruled this out quickly and blamed it on a urine infection. We took a urine sample with us and our GP tested it and she looked shocked at the result. The glucose reading was very high. She then used a blood monitor and did a finger prick test. This only showed a slight increase in glucose above a normal level. However, our GP had found it difficult initially to get the monitor to work. She contacted the hospital and they advised for us to go home and go back down in the morning. An hour later, there was a knock at my front door. And when I answered it, I found our GP standing there looking worried. She explained that we may think she was slightly mad. However, she said she wouldn't sleep tonight if she didn't check Laura's BG again. The urine test result had been so different to the BG result on the monitor that she was concerned that it hadn't been working properly. She tested Laura's BG again and it just read high. She contacted the hospital and we had to go down there immediately. What a fantastic GP. I'll never forget her and I told her this a couple of years later when I saw her again and thanked her for being so vigilant. She also said that she would never forget us and told us that GPs may only diagnose one child with type 1 diabetes in their whole careers and we were her one. From one amazing doctor to another, my fabulous consultant, Fiona Campbell. I met Fiona and my amazing nurse Jane and the fantastic team at Leeds Children's Hospital in my first week after diagnosis. I spent six days in hospital learning how to carb count. I was on MDI when I left. Before I left, we had a conversation about insulin pumps. They asked me for light one, as it meant to do less injections and it'd be a lot easier. They showed me some brochures about pumps. One of them came in pink. <coughs> the decision was made. <laughs> Our whole lives changed in February 2010 when we went from having an outgoing, healthy young daughter who was beginning to become more independent, playing out happily in the street with her friends and enjoying all aspects of her life, to a child who spent a week in hospital attached to a drip for two days with the nurse checking her blood every half an hour, day and night, and then having to inject herself up to five times a day and to calculate every ounce of carbohydrate that went into her body. A child whom I was scared to leave in a room on a row when we got home. I can only relate the feelings we had at this time to being the same as bringing a newborn baby home, only much more scary. It had already been a little bit of a rocky road for Laura, um, as she'd been struggling at school and the year before, when she was seven, she was diagnosed with severe dyslexia. In April 2010, I got my lovely pink Medtronic pump. I loved it. I had another challenge to get through. In May 2011, when a blood test and biopsy confirmed I had celiac disease. Now I had three conditions to deal with. Dyslexia type one, now celiac. I was a bit fed up. <laughs> we made a decision as a family very early on that we were not gonna let type one diabetes rule our lives. Being positive was always our goal, and getting as much information as possible was part of that. We went to conferences, read lots of books, and got lots of info from our team. We also tried to link in with local and national support networks to meet other families with children with type 1. Technology has always been an essential tool for us, and we were so lucky that in October 2011, Laura was awarded funding for full-time CGM. <laughs> we were thrilled in 2014 when we were asked by the Leeds team for Laura to be part of a pioneering artificial pancreas trial. 
This was an absolutely amazing experience for Laura. It was an overnight trial and the artificial pancreas kept Laura's blood in perfect range every single night. For the first time in four years, I was able to get a full night's sleep without worrying if Laura would be safe overnight or about long-term health complications. Following Laura's diagnosis, we became involved with JDRF. Laura did lots of fundraising, volunteering and advocacy work with them and was constantly raising awareness about type 1 diabetes. Laura and I were invited to visit Parliament with them on two occasions to help raise awareness with politicians and JDRF has been a big part of our lives and journey. JDRF funded the artificial pancreas trial and during Laura's time on the trial and afterwards she was invited to talk about her experience such at events as Network Education Days and JDRF Discovery Days. Our local news program even did a film about the artificial pancreas. This helped Laura with her confidence and self-esteem, especially with regard to her dyslexia. Laura found it difficult at school speaking out in class about her subject, however she was always happy to talk about her type 1 and it, as it was part of her and she dealt with it every day. It was very hard giving the artificial pancreas back, especially for me as it meant I had to get my matchsticks back out and go back to those night checks. However, technology was continuing to improve and we felt so lucky when Laura got the new Medtronic 640G with predicted low suspend in January 2015. I breathed a sigh of relief. This was a truly amazing pump and really helped Laura to get better control of her blood sugars, especially now that she was mostly self-managing. My type 1 journey has opened many doors for me. And one of the big ones came in 2017 when I was selected from hundreds of children to represent the UK at, children, at JDRF Children's Congress in Washington DC. I, alongside 150 young people from across the world, got to lobby Congress for more support for research into type 1 diabetes. It was an amazing experience and I got to visit the British Embassy at Capitol Hill. I met senators and congressmen and walked America's corridors of power. I did newspaper and radio interviews and a social media campaign to raise awareness. Before I went to America, I became involved with Lee's Children's Hospital Youth Forum and the amazing Type 1 Diabetes Resource Digibeat. Dr Campbell had recommended me to both of these organisations. I regularly volunteer at Digibeat events and I've been involved in the Goals of Diabetes films. My work with the Lee's Children's Hospital Youth Forum involves meeting other young people who have long-term health conditions and working alongside health practitioners to help improve services at the hospital. I also help fundraise events and help to run a children's health conference called In Your Shoes. I have also participated at talking about diabetes event in London <coughs> on their children's panel and supported Gavin Griffiths the day athlete when he ran in Leeds on one of his marathons. <coughs> Laura's biggest personal challenge came last summer when she was selected to represent the United Kingdom in the Type 1 Challenge Tour de Mont, Mont Blanc, supported by the Sweet Project World Diabetes Tour and Sanofi. Laura will be trekking up to 20 kilometres a day for six days with nine other young people who are Type 1 diabetes from around the world. She will be trekking around the Mont Blanc mountain range through France, Switzerland and Italy. She will be supported by doctors, mentors and health professionals from all around the world who either lived with type 1 or were experts in their field or even both. At first we were not sure if Laura would be physically capable of doing this challenge or the other important issue, would she cope with no hair dryer straighteners or makeup for a week? <laughs> at first, Laura had a look at the videos of the previous treks and the info reader route and was totally motivated to do it. This is the route that they took across all three uh, countries and there's the famous mountain range in the back. And then this is the trek that they did and the amount of um, each day and the amount of kilometres that they did up and down the mountain range. <coughs> It took a lot of planning. We had meetings with Laura's team in Leeds, including an in-depth meeting with Laura's fantastic dietitian, Francis Hansen, to discuss the amount of carbs that Laura would potentially need on the trip. Laura would be carrying everything, including her hypo treatment, snacks, clothes, and type supplies. The bag was packed and repacked several times in order for us to squeeze everything in. 
We had to do lots of taste testing and label checking to make sure our snacks contained the highest amount of carbs we could find and with the lightest weight. Then came the training. Laura had never done any trekking before, however she was physically fit and just needed to improve her stamina and strength. We only had a couple of months until the trek, and Laura was at college, so we had to fit in the training around an already busy schedule. Laura had some sessions with a personal trainer who was also a biology tutor, so that helped, and did some cycling with her dad and on a cycling machine at home. The dog also got lots of walks. <laughs> Finally, the big day came and she was all packed up and ready to go. Laura did not have any worries or fears about doing the trek. I, on the other hand, was a nervous wreck. At Geneva Airport, I met one of the consultants called Olga and one of the young people called Pia, who were both from Germany. I said goodbye to my parents who kindly flew over me, with me as it would have been my first time in another country without them. The taxi ride was a bit awkward as I didn't know the consultant or peer, plus they knew each other and were talking in German, so I had no idea what they were saying. <laughs> when we arrived, it was, um, sorry. when we arrived at the hotel, it turned out me and Pia were going to be roommates. Pia was very good at speaking <coughs> English and we soon became good friends. That night, we put on Dexcoms and made a video of what we wanted to get out of the track. This was funny as we all had no idea what was going on, but it helped as it meant we had time to socialise and get to know each other. The morning after the trek, the morning, the morning after it was the first, it was the time to start the trek. Honestly, it felt like I was not prepared at all. I can't remember much of the first day as the week all blended to one. So I'll just tell you about the highlights. One of the days, we had to slide on our bags down some snow on the mountain, which was really fun. <laughs> on another, we came to the top, of, top for a picture, but the cameraman was taking too long to get ready, so we had a big snowball fight. Every time we stopped for lunch, we had amazing views. Sometimes we stopped at a lake. One time, we stopped in a hut because it was raining outside. It was dark, so we used our head torches. We trekked through sun, rain, winds and hailstorms. Pia, Tibo from Belgium, Effie from Turkey and I were all walking down together and decided to put on some music and we all started singing our hearts out. This was one of my favourite memories. We had to walk across some serious bridges which did not feel safe at all. We stayed in refuges where we were all alright. But one night I had to wash my hair in a sink as all the showers did not last long. Another time the showers were freezing cold and we all were screaming in them. <laughs> At night, all the young people shared a room, hashtag no privacy. Imagine one large bunk bed with 10 matches on top and 10 below, all inside each other. With me being the smallest, I got to sleep on the smallest mattress. Every night, someone's CGM alarm went off. One time, Effie's blood went low and he kept shouting that he needed to eat, but he didn't want to. We all started laughing at him as we all understood how we were feeling. So we all stayed up and made sure he ate and was okay. Another time we had a shush competition as every, everyone used to shush when our alarms went off when we were going to bed. Every day I would be the last one at the top of the mountain but the first one at the bottom. I struggled walking up but walking down was so easy. One day we had a choice of going to the shops or going to the refuge. I got, to, I got the first choice the bed so I chose a refuge. I like my bed. <laughs> when the others got back Mike Riddell, one of the mentors, brought me back some lovely crisps which made my day. My blood levels were up and down like the mountain. Every day was different and it was hard to know what to change on my insulin settings. I decreased my insulin as the days went on from 50, 75% to 50%. I was always supported by the doctors. One day, I had a 1.8, which I never had before. I was fine though, and just sat and looked at the views. It was quite, ni quite a nice place to have hypo. <laughs> I had to eat lots of my carby snacks just to keep my blood sugars up. Despite of all the changes, all the challenges on the trek, it was one of the best experiences of my life. If I was asked to do it again, I would say yes immediately. The friends I made would be with the friends for life. The doctors, mentors, guides, and other young people people were all like family to me. 
It was absolutely fantastic. It boosted my confidence and made me more independent and I loved it. Here's a short video of the highlights. You can be checking your like your glucose like every second, so you know if it's going up, if it's going down. We had some hypos on the way, but everything has gone like as planned. We've been like distracted by the amazing views. My sugar levels got low, so I had to take some go steps. <laughs> and I had to wait five minutes so I can get well again. You want my hands? It was a tough trek, maybe the most uh, difficult with the young people. The hiking was very long lasting every day with different weather conditions. Despite the weather condition, despite diabetes management, it was beautiful just to see that no one complaining. It's always a victory because you arrive and everybody's here, so. Some of the girls uh, hug me and try to build me up. As the week has gone on, they've become a family. Oh, man. And uh, now if someone goes low, if someone needs help, everyone is there, they rally around them. This is a group of young people that have done this with diabetes and has really been able to show that there isn't anything that can stop them. People with diabetes need to know that they can dream big. I will remember this day for all the rest of my life. Thank you. to get the Medtronic Minimed 670 first self-adjusted insulin pump and we made front page news in our local uh, paper. So I've just done a couple of slides since it is about data and everything else. So this is the slides on the 670. This, the slide on the left is showing that Laura is in auto mode and what her blood glucose is at that time and the shield to show she's in auto mode. And the slide on the right is a typical overnight um, display of what our blood sugars are and that is the same consistently night after night after night on this pump and we've, she's now been on it for two months. The small <coughs> little pink dots at the top, uh, tiny microbovices of insulin that the pump is giving, it's constantly analysing her blood sugars and then making adjustments constantly throughout the day and night and then every 24 hours it has another think about it and learns even more and every seven days it does that again. So it's, it's constantly learning and adjusting to make sure that uh, she stays in range. It's all about being in range, so it's correcting her down to 6.7, that's its aim, or 8.3 if she's doing any sport. And the green band there you can see is just the, ta the, the timing range and where she's up to. We have, um, this is a typical day of Laura at college, so that's a an, an overnight. So the one on the left is a 24 hour reading, so you can see she's pretty much stayed in the green for the, that whole time. The time at the top of the, the insulin again and the blood checks, and then the little bits at the bottom when she's had food bonuses. And again, we've got another night, a different night, with again, a pretty much perfect green line. We have given it some challenges. We went skiing at New Year, and Laura, obviously, 17 and a half, has now got the challenge of drinking alcohol. So that's, that's a bit of a test for it. So you can see there, this, she's not been skiing for a few years. So in the morning, she just reduced her bolus by about 15 grams of carbs to ski. And then she goes off skiing at lunchtime. You see the dip there. So she has some food. She's a little bit more cautious in the afternoon because we've got all the morning to think about. And it does spike up. 
and then that's the, that's the after effects of that, but it brings them nicely back down into range. And then we go out for dinner and the alcohol starts and they and then so she has some alcohol um, and that there at, at midnight is that peak of alcohol with that huge dip down there throughout the night but it keeps her in range the, the graph on the right is the overnight reading from that same night so you can see it stopped giving her insulin at about 5 a.m for an hour and she's not hypoed and she's come back, back up again and everything's okay we're still learning about alcohol and the way that we see it is we've had to learn about pizza we've had to learn about Starbucks frappuccinos and now we've got to learn about alcohol it's the challenge for this year in preparation for Laura going to university for next year it's not a great slide but that's Laura's download after a couple of I think maybe about three weeks or four weeks on the 670 so she's 81% in range there on the left hand side and that's the line I did a download yesterday so she's been on the pump for eight weeks and skiing, Christmas, alcohol, everything else, she was 76% in range with a very similar line to that at the top. So it's going really, really well for us at the moment. Um, some more data. I've done a Laura's HbA1c timeline. So um, every time I go to clinic, and I'll have to stop it soon, I realise, but I put in my phone a little note about what Laura's HbA1c is and even a height and weight because I'm really sad. So, um, and I looked back in my phone to see when I first started doing this, and it was back in December 2013, so we were a couple of years into diagnosis, and I, on my phone that's exactly what it said, 57, 7.4 for our friends in America, so it's a little bit easier for you to see, and, um, and for me, my brain, and I put yes next to it, and this was when the NICE target was 58 at that time, so we were prob that was probably us having a, our first time at getting underneath that target, and Laura is 12. We then go into 2014, and Laura does the artificial pancreas trial, um, when she starts on the trial, we've made a little bit more of an improvement, and we're now at 55. And when she comes off the trial, so she's only on the trial for three months overnight and it's just for overnight, an overnight trial. So for those three months we come off the trial in October and her HbA1c is at 44, 6.2, which we're absolutely thrilled about. It was just an amazing day when we got that result. Laura's now 13. And then Laura gets the 640G pump in the January and that year we go up and down a bit. Um, 48, 54, 50, the same time Laura's now doing much more self-managing, so she's out there on her own, she's got a pump that works very well with her and we're letting go of those reins a little bit, she's now 13 to 14 years old. And then the new target comes in in August 2015, and again that's that same time that year, lots of learning for Laura and, and then we've got all the teenage hormones and everything else, 14, 15. We're going to 2017 and Laura's now learning more, we're learning more and that target starts to come down 52, 6.9, 6.8 as she gets into 60. And then the start of last year, um, really, really good results. She's now pretty much self-managing all the time apart from the nights because don't fathom down we wake her up for her alarms. That's another challenge for this year. <laughs> so she's um, 48, 45 there in June and then we go on an all-inclusive family wedding holiday to Cyprus and Laura discovers vodka and we have that flip. Um, so when we go on November I'm really out of my approach to be able to see it's not going to be very good. I'm really sorry she's discovered vodka and um, it's um, 51 so we were fairly happy with that. Four weeks later, literally four weeks of the day, we have our clinic appointment um, in, at the end of December, so four weeks on the 670G, and her HBMC was back at 45, so really, really impressive there. And we're looking forward to March when our next appointment is to see what that will bring. Okay, Laura and I just put a little slide together of um, what we, what's worked for us and we what think might work for other people as well to, that might be able to help you. And a lot of the things we've put are things that have come up already in the day. So a quick diagnosis, a very vigilant GP, Laura was not um, unwell when we arrived in hospital, she wasn't in DKA. We were carb counting from day one, um, we were trained in that, we, those, that skill set was embedded when we left hospital so we could only build on it, the ward staff were trained, the menus were carb counted. Um, so when we left hospital you know, we felt, we felt, we were, uh, we felt skilled up and also being in hospital that little bit more of a length of time, so it was six nights, we felt psychologically we'd processed a lot of things as well and we'd had that support, which I think is really important. 
When we came out of hospital, really good telephone out of our support, and then ongoing support from the team as the years have gone on, all the professionals that we've needed to, and now good transitions to support. We don't feel we're being rushed, and we feel it's balanced between the young person and the parent. Um, structured education, <coughs> transition to high school days, Wicked Week, which is all about alcohol and everything else. Digibe, Laura's very involved with Digibe, um, and as we said before in the day, involving the young person in co-designing projects, inviting them to speak at things like this about their achievements or challenges is really beneficial for them. Good support from school and college, a good communication to link to the team in those early years, and then later years, thinking about good access arrangement for exams. That's another area that is, is really difficult for our young people. Technology has been a massive part of our journey, access to technology. Um, teach families to do downloads, which many of you have spoken about today, and to understand the results. Use them you know, as well, so that it's, that it's part, obviously, it's, it's a big part of their life. And any research opportunities that come up to encourage families to be involved in. And links to support, information, JDRF, Diabetes UK, local support groups conferences, online support, Digibeat, peer support, and meeting inspirational people with Type 1. We've found meeting other people and Laura having friends all over the country and world now with Type 1 has really helped. And a big thing for Laura has been access to a youth work <coughs> to the youth forum at Leeds Children's Hospital and um, she's benefited greatly from that. Okay, so I'll leave the last words to Laura. Type 1 diabetes is my friend and not my enemy. It has helped me grow and develop as a person, and it is part of who I am. I want to use all the fantastic opportunities that I have been given to inspire other young people and show them that type 1 diabetes will not stop them from doing what they want to do. I want to say a huge thank you for inviting me here today and listening to me and my story. An even bigger thank you to my amazing consultant, Fiona Campbell, and her fantastic team in Leeds. I wouldn't, be here, I wouldn't be where I am today without their help and support. I'll leave you with this final slide. So we're really, really proud that Laura, Laura um, has got an unconditional offer now to go to Leeds Beckett University in September to study, to be a youth worker. That's what she wants now to do in her career. So, um, so proud of what she's done and what she's achieved. Thank you very much, Alyssa.